Good morning. morning. You guys have energy today. It's going to be interesting. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And if you're new here to Southwest Florida, welcome. You may be on vacation. More and more people are coming in. We're out of season, so some of the regular members are back up north, but then there's vacationers. Naples is a vacation destination. But it has been brought to my attention that some other places that weren't vacation destinations are now becoming vacation destinations. Why? Because a lot of people have placed themselves on permanent vacation. People don't want to work. I learned of a new term. We actually have a worker shortage. This is unbelievable. I never thought in my whole life I would see such a thing. Back in the day, you'd have to apply for a job, and you'd be nervous, waiting for the callback. You'd go for the interview, maybe another interview. It was a process. But now, people will just hire you no matter what you know how to do. So it's frustrating. A lot of employers... They're putting out help wanted signs everywhere, and some of them are kind of funny. So I want to share some with you this morning. Ready? Let's, let's check some of these out. We need a graphic designer. <laughs> Obviously. <clears throat> That's a good one. I like that. All right, I'll let you guys figure this one out for yourselves. <laughs> That's a decent one. This one was funny, got my attention. Now hiring cashier weekends must be 21 plus sign, applications of veil inside. Cannot look anything like Skeletor from He-Man. <laughs> Dating myself there. This next one looks like a pizza place up north. Server, sober. Now, I cannot read the fine print, but maybe you can. It must be funny. Sober, asterisk, sane, non-dramatic, experienced, able to work mornings, <laughs> Clearly, appreciation of skillful sarcasm, helpful. This is the perfect job for Heather, <laughs> all right? So if you know her, that's all funny. Here's some newspaper ads. That's still a thing, I guess. Surgeon wanted for a new health clinic opening in the area. No experience needed. <laughs> Must have own tools. <laughs> Wow, I'll bring my toolbox. Here's another one. Someone to grind or chew hay for horse, saving money on the A, with bad teeth. Just get in contact with good old bud. <laughs> really? And here's my favorite. Scarecrow on it. All right. A volunteer is wanted to work as a scarecrow in a field near Didcot. I don't know where that is. Weekends only. No previous experience, again, is needed as full scarecrow training <laughs> will be given. Really. Must be able to stand up for several hours without a break and have no fear of birds. The next line 
is ironic. No time wasters, please. <laughs> you can email them right there. They didn't even scratch out <laughs> the email. All right. All right, we got to change that because I'm not going to be able to concentrate. So recently, <laughs> I told you a story <laughs> about a husband and wife. We've been following them along. I told you this story before, but you guys forget. You don't remember what I say, so I'll tell it again. Different angle on it, though. They've been cooped up for a while in the house, and the wife really wants to go on vacation. She wants to come here to Naples. But she's thinking of fancy things. She wants to splurge. She's thinking of the fine dining, the shopping that we have here, the beaches. And so she proposes the idea to her husband. Hey, we saved a lot of money. We didn't go on vacations last year, so let's do it right. We're going to stay at the Ritz-Carlton. And she tries to, uh -oh, tries to coax him in with the wings. They have the best wings at Gumbo Limbo. Go eat them there. They're great. We moved down here for the wings at Gumbo Limbo. But this doesn't work. No, what's going on in the husband's mind is, ah, I really want to improve the house. I want to spend money on tools. Maybe I can get myself another job. Anyway, he doesn't want to go on vacation and spend the money. Instead of just saying that, right? So people do this type of thing. They just don't say the real reason. I just want to concentrate on the house right now. Kind of lazy, not feeling the Naples thing. It's hot. Why go there? No. Instead, he gets religious on her, legalistic. And he says, you know, that's... That's a lot of money. Don't you feel bad about spending that much money? No, she's like, oh, here we go. I just want to have a good time. You know, they're Christians. And so he's laying it on thick. And he decides to keep pressing down on this point. He says, you know, if we're going to spend that much money, we should do something spiritually rewarding. I think we should go to the Holy Land. I want to climb Mount Sinai. We'll go mountain climbing in the desert. When we get to the top, we can shout out the Ten Commandments. Wouldn't that be great? She's like, yeah, it might, but we might want to try actually doing the Ten Commandments first, don't you think? Got them back there. Today, that's what we're going to be looking at, the Ten Commandments. We're in Exodus. I'm excited about it. We're going to do, <laughs> so is Phil, Exodus 19 through 34-ish. We're going to be skipping around a little bit. I told you about that. We're doing the Bible topically, and that means we kind of have to skip over some things sometimes. So we had the Exodus last week and the Passover account. Very important festival that we looked at. And actually, what's interesting, didn't plan it this way. We're on the eve in the Jewish calendar of the next festival we're going to be talking about. So I'm doing things by festivals, the Feast of Weeks. And that is to commemorate the giving of the law, the initial giving of the law. That's what the Jewish people still do today. And that's on the calendar. We're on the eve of it. Tomorrow will be that holiday. We're going to look at another festival next week and another festival the following week. There are three pilgrimage festivals the Jewish people are supposed to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. This is biblically mandated for them. We see it in both the Old and the New Testament. So after the Exodus, there's a three or two-ish month period. You may be confused. Different Bible versions say different things. They're on a lunar calendar. And even the name of the holiday here, Pentecost or Shavuot, which means weeks, can be confusing in and of itself because it's 50, but it's really not 50. It's kind of confusing. So 49 days in reality go by. And here, the Israelites find themselves at Mount Sinai. You've been paying attention. This is significant. The Lord is going to appear again. He appeared to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Now he's going to appear to Moses and then the Israelites at this very same place. But did you know, a little biblical fact for you guys, Moses is a mountain climber. Did you know that? If you pay attention to the story, the way most people envision this account is that Moses goes up the mountain, does his thing, and then he's the one shouting out the Ten Commandments and all that. And that's it. Goes back down, kills a bunch of Israelites. We'll get there. Anyway, 
That's not quite how it happens. Moses goes up and down and up and down and up and down, over and over and over again. It goes in cycles. So if you're reading the story and it's not being told to you, it gets long. It's pretty interesting. So I'll save some time for you this morning. But imagine this as I tell the story. Moses is no spring chicken. He's 80 years old. So you have to picture this isn't like a younger guy just strapping young lad going up the mountain. You can't just get up there in like five minutes or something. It's got to take some time. So it's an older man going up and down and up and down. Pretty vigorous guy. The Bible tells us that later about Moses. So, so he climbs up the mountain the first time. It says this, Exodus 19.4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, is the Lord speaking. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me, pay attention to that. If you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So now... Moses goes down the mountain, and he reiterates this, and this is interesting, Exodus 19, 8, and all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord, climbs back up. Now the Lord is speaking to him from a thick cloud, so you have to just imagine that here, get that, get that in your mind. And here we see some rules for the mountain. This is interesting. So he says, don't even let anybody come near it, touch it. If someone touches it, don't touch them. Just shoot them with arrows or stone them to death. Nobody's to touch it, not even the animals. Okay. So he climbs down. Not before. The Lord tells him, get the people ready. In three days, I'm going to appear to you. So consecrate them. So goes down the mountain, gets the people ready. They're to totally consecrate themselves, abstain from intercourse. Third day comes, on the morning of the third day. Now the Lord appears. He comes down on Mount Sinai in full power and glory. So you have to imagine like all the natural disasters at once happening except like flooding, except water disasters, all the fiery disasters. So it's like a volcano, this mountain. There's fire everywhere. It's creating a furnace of smoke. It's like a big billowing furnace, lightning crashing down everywhere, thunder. The earth is quaking. So this is like nothing you've ever seen before. This is incredible. The power an enormity of the Lord. So everything's going crazy. The people are trembling. Moses can approach the mountain. Now, there's an interesting thing if you're paying attention. The Lord initially says that the people can come up the mountain when they hear the ram's horn. So along with all this stuff, there's this increasing, it's getting louder and louder, this ram's horn blowing. While all this other stuff is going on. It's a terrifying event. But Moses climbs up the mountain again. The Lord reiterates this command about not touching the mountain again, over again. And then he says something about coming up the mountain, but Moses is confused. He's like, no, you said no one can come up the mountain, not anybody. But he says, well, next time bring Aaron with you. Now, at this point in the story, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of thinking, if I'm Moses, because we know he kind of talked back to God a little, right? Like, who am I to speak? I get tongue-tied. I'd be saying, listen, couldn't you have told me all of this the first time, right? You know, like just, I know we don't listen all the time, but why are you repeating this again and again? It's not as if, like, he goes outside. Like, I get kind of frustrated when I go upstairs, I forget something, I have to come back down the stairs. I go upstairs, I forget something, I come back down the stairs. And I'm like, okay, let me write a list because I'm tired. This guy's going up a mountain. <laughs> Getting these instructions. And now think about it for a second. Lightning, thunder crashing. This is not a pleasant experience going on here. It's nuts. So he takes the instructions back down to the Israelite. Got to be tired. And now the Lord gives the Ten Commandments. It comes from the Lord's voice. They hear it. Do you know the Ten Commandments? It's kind of interesting. Some people don't. Now I'll forget, 
right? Now that I do this, I kind of make a wise remark. I'm like, oh, no. You'll have no other gods but me. Don't make any idols. So back then, it's a big deal. You're going to carve images. No carved or graven images in the old language. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Don't use his name or misuse his name wrongly. Keep a Sabbath day. Right? Even when God created the earth, worked for six days, took the seventh day off, you are not better than him. Take a day off. Keep it holy to the Lord. Honor your parents. Don't murder, commit adultery, steal, lie, especially in court, or covet, lust after your neighbor's goods. The Ten Commandments. Then, this is what happens. Exodus 20, 18. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing up from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen. Right. But don't let God speak directly to us, or we will die. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. Both sides of the coin there. We don't want to listen to God. We'll listen to you instead. So you just keep going up that mountain. So then Moses approaches the Lord. And here's where everybody drops off. This is when people close the Bible and they're like, okay, here we go. But there's some interesting things in there. So this is the way the Old Testament works, the first five books especially. You're going to have a memorable account and then either a whole bunch of, or both, genealogies and laws, different laws, which seem totally random. But I'm going to try to give you a right way of thinking about this. And it's interesting, some of the stuff in here. So what will happen is he'll start talking about building altars and how to do that. There's some funny stuff if you have a good sense of humor. He says, don't make stairs because if you do, they might be able to look up under your skirt and see your nakedness. Kind of interesting stuff in these laws. They kind of make you laugh if you have a sense of humor. But here's an easy way to think of this because it said that there are 613 laws in the law of Moses. I never counted them all because I ran out of fingers and toes. That's about as far as I get. But they say, that after the Ten Commandments, there's 603, if I can count, other commands. And people have done it. There's charts and graphs and things like that. You might think, why? What's going on here? Think of the Ten Commandments as like a table of contents. It's what the whole chapter is about. And then there's the text. There's all the stuff explaining it. Or a contract or something like that, where you have like the main bullet points and the rest of the fine print that nobody ever reads, kind of like the rest of the Bible like that, right? So you have your amendments and all these different things. So you'll talk about slaves and the treatment of slaves. It's hard to relate to because we don't have them today. It's kind of a bad word, but some of them were like servants, right? They would apply themselves to it and there are stipulations about whether the person wants to leave or not. Sometimes a slave wouldn't want to leave. They like their, quote, master and they want to stay with them. They're a part of the family. So it's kind of like that. Then you have commands about murder. What is it? What is murder? What's the difference between killing someone and murdering someone? Well, they connect it to stealing. If a thief comes in and it's dark, well, it's not murder. But if it's during the daytime, ooh, you're a murderer. So interesting things like that. So you see how it's explaining the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not murder. Well, what, what if, what if, what if, da -da 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 -da. So you get all these different laws. Interwoven, very important, is idolatry, about worshiping other gods. It'll be all interwoven throughout it. Sexual sin, testifying falsely in court, definitions about those things. And if you're paying close attention, the Sabbath is really, really, really important. It comes up almost more than anything else, and in ways in which people don't normally think about all the time. In fact, it says that this covenant here that's celebrated on Pentecost, that the Sabbath, Sabbath is the sign of the covenant. So remember Abraham's covenant, Genesis 15 and 17? The sign was circumcision. So this, the Sabbath, is the sign of this covenant. It is super super important. Now, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it, Gene, I guess, but what about the priestly laws? Ten Commandments don't say anything about priests. 
Not kind of, because it talks about the Sabbath. Well, the priests are going to be the ones who not only help you atone for the sins with all the sacrifices if you break all these commandments or any of these commandments. By the way, the one for breaking the Sabbath is death, so there's nothing really they can do for you except kill you. But these holidays, they're really important. They're Sabbaths as well. So you have a day Sabbath, but you also have like week-long Sabbaths like the Passover. You're not supposed to really work except preparing the meal. So there's definitions of the Sabbath. So the Sabbath, whether you know it or not, is talked about a lot, a lot in the Old Testament. Now, in the midst of these laws, the people, again, reiterate their commitment. So you get three-ish chapters there. All these different laws, extensions, if you will, of the Ten Commandments. And then you'll get kind of another story here. Exodus 24, starting at verse 3. Then Moses went down to the people and repeated all the instructions and regulations the Lord had given him. It's not going to end here either. It's going to keep going, going, going. All the people answered with one voice, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. Now, this is interesting. If you keep going, then Moses carefully wrote down all the Lord's instructions. Early the next morning, Moses got up and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. He also set up 12 pillars, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, we went through in the genealogy, the sons of Israel. Then he sent some of the young Israelite men to present burnt offerings and to sacrifice bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses drained half the blood from these animals into basins. The other half he splattered against the altar and the people. So do you remember the Passover? Covered by the blood. It has significance. So this is what's going on here. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to all the people. Check this out. And they all responded, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. Keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the story. So then something really interesting happens. I'll just summarize it for you. There's a covenant meal, and here's where it gets cleared up for us. So it's Aaron, his two oldest children, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 or, some versions say, 70 elders. Remember, there's 72 elders, so remember that number as we keep going. They go a certain distance up the mountain. And they have a covenant meal in the presence of the Lord. They eat and drink in the presence of the Lord. And it says where he's standing looks like this beautiful gemstone, lapis lazuli, really gorgeous place. So think about it. So it's in the midst of all this craziness. Has it dissipated? I don't know. But regardless, this desert mountain, it's beautiful. It's like heaven. It's like this beautiful place of this covenant meal. Then, here's where we clear up the confusion. It says that Moses goes the rest of the way up the mountain. So apparently, these consecrated people, the 70 elders, Aaron, his sons are priests by extension. They can go a certain distance up, but only Moses can go all the way up. Now, he goes up there, and he spends a total of 40 days receiving instructions from the Lord. Remember that. Now, we learn more if we keep Reading on, there's all kinds of descriptions, and this is what gets confusing. I'll unconfuse it for you sometimes in the Bible. Sometimes you're getting descriptions of things later to be built. And so it's not necessarily being built right now, but they'll describe like the ark, the tabernacle, all that other stuff. So they'll tell them first how they are to build it, and then Moses will give those instructions. He'll relay them going up, up and down, up and down the mountain. So... Moses is on the mountain for a long time. People get kind of antsy. And they go to Aaron, and they say, where's this Moses guy? Make us gods that we can worship. And Aaron, if you're reading, doesn't really say anything about it, except, okay, <laughs> give me, and this is interesting, the earrings of your wives and your children. What he's going to do is he's going to melt them down, and then make this golden calf, mold the golden calf, however he does it. Isn't that interesting? Take the things from your ears that you should be listening with and have them melted down. So keep that in mind. So he makes it. They love it. He builds an altar to it. They celebrate a feast. It's his pagan revelry. So they're worshiping this golden calf. Cut away, seen to the Lord and Moses on the mountain. God's like, yo, 
Your people are out of control. I'm done with them. I'm going to wipe them out completely. That's it. It's over. Remember this. Moses intercedes for them. He's like, no, no, no. It should remind you a little bit of Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah, same type of thing where you have this kind of deal making. And he goes through all these different numbers of people. He keeps reducing the number, making a deal. He's kind of like a salesman there. Moses does about the same thing. He goes through these different reasonings. And the first one he uses is that, well, the other nations, they're going to mock you, right? Because you created this nation, you set them apart, and then now they're just doing their own thing. So God relents. He says, all right, fine. Now Moses, it's his turn to go down the mountain and try to sort things out. Remember, he's got the stone tablets with him. And Joshua's with him at a certain point. We don't know where. It doesn't say where he picks them up. But we know he probably didn't go all the way up the mountain with him. He comes down with the tablets. Joshua hears it first. Whoa, they're celebrating. Something's going on or there's war in the camp. What is it? Moses is like, no, there's no war in the camp. <laughs> they're worshiping. They're celebrating. Moses gets so angry, he breaks the tablets. He smashes them to the ground. He's mad. Then he goes, gets the golden calf, burns it up, grinds it into powder, throws it on the water, and makes them drink it. Why does he do that? Well, he's going to turn that by them ingesting it. It's going to turn that idol, that fake god, into excrement or garbage. All right? So that's what he's doing. That's what this god is now. Then he goes to Aaron, <laughs> bro, what are you doing? Now, Aaron is completely unapologetic. He doesn't care. He's like, well, you know how these people are. They're crazy. So I got all their jewelry together. I put it in a furnace and I'll pop this calf. <laughs> kind of like that. Really? Great. So what most people remember is that Moses now along with the Levites, if you know the story, kill 3,000 people. And that's where they go. But there's something else that happens in there that's very, very important to consider and remember. It's actually a couple of things. One, Moses gives them a chance. He says, all who are for the Lord, come here with me, be on my side. Now the Levites join him. Then they kill the people, but think about it for a second. Moses has interceded for them. God wanted to wipe them out completely. He was done with them. So the fact that they exist at all is good of Moses, right? So good on Moses. The other thing is, again, Moses had warned them, come here on my side. And if you remember the Exodus account, it says there are 600,000 men that are redeemed from Israel. 600,000 men. I told you it's probably, scholars will say, 2.5 million people. So when you think about it, it's not good that anyone would die. Not good that anyone would die, but 3,000 is a very small percentage of 2.5 million. So it's not like he's wiping out all of the Israelites. So now we get another scene of intercession. Moses continues to intercede for his people, keeps going, and now Moses wants to see God's glory. So we get a scene of Moses in God's glory, God passes by him, but not the front of him. He protects Moses with his hand and passes by. Moses gets to see the back of God. Now, he spends another 40 days on the mountain receiving instructions from the Lord. People don't realize that. It's not one trip, 40 days. It's a lot of trips and a total of 80 days, two cycles of 40 on the mountain. He gets new tablets now written by the finger of God. He takes them down to the people, but this time he's been in the presence of the Lord and his face is shining. He doesn't realize it at first, but his face is glowing. Now, do you remember last week? It should make you think of the transfiguration. Right? So this is a foreshadowing of what would happen in Jesus. His face is shining. He's in the presence of Moses and Elijah. So this happens, but the difference here is that Moses will now cover it with a veil. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 3. Then more instructions about the Sabbath. Now, many don't know 
that what happened in these chapters is the initiation, the foreshadowing of what would come later on the celebration of this festival, commemorating the giving of the law in the book of Acts, Pentecost. So the Jewish people, it's Shavuot, weeks, but to us, Pentecost, 50-ish. So we talked about Jesus' death fulfilling the Passover. He fulfills these feasts. It's all fulfilled in Christ. He dies. Three days, he rises from the dead. But then he spends 40 days among his people, just like Moses, 40 days on the mountain. Now, if you couple Luke and Acts together, Acts is written by Luke, Jesus gives some instructions, both at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts. And essentially it is, wait. So you might think Matthew 28, the end of the Gospel of Matthew, go and make disciples of all nations. That they immediately run out and do it. But if you get to Luke, you realize, he says, but wait here in Jerusalem. Again, in Acts, for his ascension, wait. Kind of important. Then, we see that the disciples, there are 120 others, or about 120 people total. They're hanging out in the upper room in Jerusalem, waiting. Very important that we understand that. They choose Matthias. He has to replace Judas, who's killed himself. He betrayed Jesus and then killed himself. Then, on the Passover, this is what happens. Or the day of Pentecost, this is what happens. Acts 2.1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Sound familiar? Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So Pentecost celebrates the giving of the law. Now Acts fulfills that with the giving of the Holy Spirit, the fulfillment of that prophecy. The prophets indeed said there would come a time, and this is important to think about and relate to, that God would fill his chosen people with his spirit and no longer will they have hearts of stone, but now hearts of flesh. And on those hearts of flesh, he will write his law on them. The law is going to be within you. So no longer is it on tablets of stone, but in you. That's what will cause you to obey them, the Holy Spirit and this indwelling here. So places like Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah 31, when we combine them. Now, most don't know that the Spirit operates and is active in the Old Testament as well. We're going to see that in Bezalel. It says that he's filled with the Spirit to make these priestly garments and the tabernacle, which is like the portable temple. It's like set up church in the wilderness when they're with them. But Acts means that there's no longer this selective giving of the Spirit for specific reasons. It is an outpouring of the Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is available to all who come to Christ. Very important to understand that. All of you. We all have gifts that we operate by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. All of us who are in Christ. Pentecost is kind of like a pouring, a waterfall, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Right? So some believe that it's just not the same now. It was just unbelievable. In fact, Peter he begins to preach, and he actually quotes Joel chapter 2, where it talks about pouring his spirit, the sons and daughters will prophesy. And so Peter makes this very clear that this is what's happening. Now, we talked about how Christ fulfilled the festivals, and indeed, we are under a new and better covenant in Christ. The Bible study will probably get to Hebrews 8 through 10, and we're going to see this. Christ has fulfilled it. He's superior to all of these things. He writes his law on our hearts so that, this is the part that people don't like, we obey him. We don't like the word obey, do we? But Jesus says it, John 14, 21, those who accept my commandments and 
obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them, said Jesus. So notice a couple of things there. There's greasy grace Christianity that teaches that, ah, I'm good, I accepted Jesus, and now I can just do whatever I want. I can go through this repeating cycle. Do whatever I want, up, oh, rebaptize. Do whatever I want, re-come to Jesus. Do whatever I want. Jesus says, no, if you're doing it, you do not love me. The ones who love me obey my what? Commandments. A lot of Christians want to just throw it away. Well, there are no more commandments anymore. That's it. I do whatever I want. But that's not what Christian means. Christian means baby Christ. It was a joke in the beginning. The Romans would call them that. Oh, you little baby Christians. It doesn't mean we can do whatever we want all the time. Indeed, Christ has fulfilled the law, but that doesn't mean there are no laws to follow. We are under a new covenant, but that doesn't mean we should be breaking, for example, the Ten Commandments. And in fact, for all of Christianity, these have been a standard. Kids in Sunday school can recite them. They can tell you what they are. And if you say, should I break that one? I'm going to quiz you. No. <laughs> I was going to make a joke about it. you guys being really brave. So, no problem. <laughs> You've been good, though. You've been good. Better than some of the older people here. <laughs> Hang in there. I'm still going. But think about it. The kids in Sunday school, they can list them. And if you said, should you break that one? They'd go, no, we shouldn't. They know better. What one of us would say, yeah, we should have other gods, worship other gods, great idea. Who would say it was a good idea to take the name of the Lord in vain? No, you shouldn't do that. Dishonor your parents? No. Hey, it's a good idea to murder just on the weekends. <laughs> Commit adultery? Just on the weekends, maybe. Mm. Steal? No. Lie? No. Lust after your neighbor's wife or husband? No, no. Well, what's the problem here? If you're paying really close attention, you might have noticed something. I skipped one. Who knows which one I skipped? The Sabbath. That's because the Sabbath is one of our favorite ones to break. It's the only one we're prideful about breaking. Now, I want to just say something. I know about the New Testament. I know about Romans 14. I know about Colossians. I get it. We do not have to take a Sabbath. We're not required to. But the context there is don't make fun of everyone who doesn't take a Sabbath or does take a Sabbath. Don't argue over stuff like that. But it seems pretty important when we read the Bible. And again, we get prideful about breaking it. Pride. Isn't that interesting? No, oh, here, I, I work. Right? We like to show everybody. Even Jesus, though Jesus teaches us not to do that, don't let one hand know what the other hand is doing. Ooh, we love to. And the other thing we like to do is control everything. Even though we know we're not God, we kind of act like it sometimes, don't we? Instead of just listening to the Lord, letting the Lord operate. We want to be both employer and employee. The other word we don't like is listen. We don't like obey and listen. But God says we should, and God says it's really important. Have you ever tried to hire someone? Have you ever been in that position? Now, I worked in the business world, so I had to hire lots of people. At the church, sometimes we have to hire people. Maybe you can think of some of like the worst employees you've ever had. How about this guy? You tell him what to do, and he's the yeah, but guy. The yeah, but guy. Okay, I need you to go and do the yeah, but, and that guy usually has a better way of doing things. Right? But, but maybe we can do it like this. I'm like, yeah, but. That guy. Questioning, the why guy. Why? <laughs> like, can you do this, this, and this? Why? So I don't fire you? Why? Like, just please do it? People do not like to listen. 
That is so common. In fact, it's so common that when I got employed, people like my overseer, he would be surprised. Like, he would just do something, nothing more, nothing less, no added commentary, just get it done. Probably the martial arts training, I don't know. But apparently, that's a really rare thing. We talked about places that are hiring, but maybe you didn't know. The church is hiring. The church is looking for workers. It's looking for help. And I mean the church globally, not just here. And it has from the beginning. Jesus sends out his 70 elders, or disciples, if you will. He sends them out, and when he does, Luke 10, 2, these were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. The church has always been looking for good workers. Now, what are some attributes of a good worker? Humility. Obedience. Listening. You see, first and foremost, a good worker is a good listener. We talked about not listening last week and how it can kind of get you into some trouble. Jesus is teaching in the next chapter of Luke, chapter 11. And as he was speaking, a woman in the crowd called out, God bless your mother, the womb from which you came, and the breasts that nurse you. Jesus replied, but even more blessed are those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. We need to put it into practice. But what? Well, to find that out, we need to stop and listen. We need to carve out the time to read this, to listen to the instructions, and to pray, to be in the presence of the Lord. We need to know when we are to operate. In Mark's gospel account, he sends them. When they come back, Jesus says, get rest. We need to take the time to do that to rest and be in the presence of the Lord, receive instructions, be patient, just be in the presence of the Lord. It's very important. It's hard to do that when we're keeping ourselves so busy all the time. You see, Aaron needed to wait. He didn't need to be listening to the impatient Israelites. And it's like that in our lives, too. You ever have someone pressure you into making a bad decision? That's what happens here. We need to turn off the noise. Wait. Listen to the Lord. A lot of people don't know. Praying means listening. It's not always talking. We like to talk, 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 talk. Listening and being in the presence of the Lord. Receiving instructions from him. Think about it. That's what Moses is doing. Two cycles of 40 days. What's he doing? Listening, receiving instructions from the Lord. Not doing very much except that. It's very important. In fact, on the second account, it says he has no food or water for those 40 days. That's a miracle. Can't go without water for more than a week or so. But he's sustained by the words of the Lord. Now, if you know your Gospels well, you know that Jesus initiates his ministry by fasting in the desert for 40 days. Now, I'm not sure about the water, but definitely no bread. And guess what? Like the impatient Israelites, Satan approaches Jesus and tries him to make some, get him to make some bad decisions. We know it doesn't work. He tempts him, jump off a cliff, basically. I'll give you all these kingdoms. But what's the first one? Jesus has got to be kind of hungry. He is in human form, God in human form. So if you're really God's son, turn that stone into a loaf of bread. What does Jesus say? Man doesn't live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's important. Every word that comes from from the mouth of the Lord. We need to be patient and wait. 
Because the Lord has a better plan for us. A good listener listens to God. We have to shut off the noise around us, the ideas of the world that get us into trouble all the time, and listen to the Lord. So that's my encouragement to you this morning. That's what I propose. Let's be a biblical church of workers devoted to listening to the Lord and carrying out not our plan, but his. Amen? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church. I ask that you fill these workers with your spirit. That is what enables us to carry out your plan, your good work, that they may be excellent vehicles of your love for the sake of the gospel. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.